<laughs> Foolish bandit, you think you can defeat me, Shadrick of Versity, the mighty adventurer? Well, sir, I shall show you. <laughs> Critical hit in the head, dead. That's how he. You must stay in the adjacent square. Um, couple of questions. First, uh, who are you? This strange theory of voice coming out of the time? Sky, you know, I can't, I don't, I, can't, I don't see you. The Game Master. What is a Game Master? Basically, I'm like, you know, the god of this world. I control everything. F fair enough. Okay, then, uh, next question. Why do I have to stay in the adjacent five foot square? I, I technically didn't even step. Look, look, when I moved, foot still there and hit. Uh, why? I don't make the rules. What do you mean you don't make the rules? You, you just said you're effectively the god of this world. I am the god of this kind of. Well, change the rules. What? Are you kidding me? Yeah, sure. Like, next time I give you a skill check or a savings throw, you'll just say, I made it up. And you I try so hard at this, you have no idea. And you play just straight back in my face without giving a proper gratitude at all. You suck. Do you need a Mountain Dew? Yes. And, and now you have syphilis! Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad and it is Tabletop Time. Oh wait, wrong channel. Go check out Tabletop Time if you're interested in seeing me get up to some role-playing shenanigans, which is very related to the topic of this video. And that is... How realistic is Dungeons and Dragons con combat? But before we go there, I want to let you know that you can actually get a free audiobook. I love audiobooks, I've listened to them for ages, well before they became a sponsor of this channel, but now they are and they're sponsoring this video. And seriously, this is a great deal. And it's just gotten a lot better because with the holidays upon us, Audible is offering a new membership plan for just $4.95 a month for the first six months, and after that it's just $7.95 a month. The retail cost of some of these audiobooks is $20 and sometimes $30, but with the monthly credit you get with your Audible subscription, you can get any of these audiobooks for a fraction of the cost. This is a legitimately brilliant deal. And with your membership, you get Audible Plus, which gives you full access to the Plus catalog. This is filled with thousands of select Audible originals that you can't get anywhere else. These are audiobooks, podcasts, and include ad-free versions of popular shows, as well as exclusive series. And this is all for just $4.95 a month for the first six months. This is the best value deal I've ever seen come out of Audible. It is amazing. And it's so easy to sign up right now. All you have to do is go to www.audible.com forward slash Shadowversity, or if you're in the US, you text Shadowversity to 500 500. And any audiobook from their whole selection, I would suggest my own audiobook. I love audiobooks so much, I made my own, and it's available on Audible, narrated by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding, two of the best narrators you can find, right? Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror. But if you've already checked that out, well, might I suggest Dragons of Autumn Twilight, the first book in the Dragonlance series. Dragonlance, in case you didn't know, is based on Dungeons and Dragons fantasy. It even has some of the classic Dungeons and Dragons spells in the book, with of course the classic fantasy races. And it, what I say, classic, Dragonlance is one of the grandfathers of, you know, modern classic medieval D&D fantasy by now. It's absolutely awesome. If you haven't tried it out, well, you can try it for free now, okay? It's that simple. Just go to www.audible.com forward slash Shadowversity, or if you're in the US, you text Shadowversity to 500-500. Say thank you for Audible for sponsoring this video. So, a very fair question to ask in regards to the context of this video is why I even bother? Why is this important? Because the rules as are for combat in Dungeons & Dragons they obviously work, and they've worked for many years, and I know because I've played D&D for ages. Started with 1st edition, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, 3.5 was my jam, 4th edition I didn't even get into, and I hear 5th edition is pretty darn good. And so clearly it does the job what it needs to, because this is a game, it's not necessarily meant to reflect real life, but there's an important caveat there. And in regards to role playing, you are taking the role of an adventurer, and you often like to act out what they're doing, but even more so, you like to think of creative, unique ways to win against your opponents. And in regards to combat, 
that's actually a really fun, satisfying thing to think of. What if I did this to try and give myself an advantage to beat a difficult foe? And it is profoundly disappointing when you think of something that logically in the real life you should be able to do. You know the limits and lengths of your own physical abilities, and especially for someone who might be even more physically inclined than you, the adventurer you're role playing. We've all seen some Olympic level athletes do some pretty amazing things, so we know what a human of this level can generally do. And if you think of something that is creative and you technically it should easily be able to be done in the real world and then you are denied because the rules simply don't allow it that is profoundly dissatisfying like massively so and i actually think there is a hole in the rules now i'm using dungeons and dragons as the primary point of reference and this is really just looking at dnd rules but having said that, a lot of the limitations that I'll be pointing out here are reflective in a lot of other role-playing games. And so it would make sense if I point out or give suggestions of ways to improve it to make tabletop role-playing game combat more realistic and therefore more satisfying to give more options to the players to uh, think of creative ways to win against their opponents. But the thing is, I've already done that. I, with my brother Jazza, you might know him from the YouTube channel Jazza, have actually made our own role-playing game addressing many of the problems that we have found in classic role-playing games like D&D, uh, making combat more satisfying and realistic. And so as the point of reference for certain improvements, I probably will be actually referencing some of the uh, rule examples that we have in cogent role play as an example of how things can be improved upon and you don't need to do it the way that we've done it in our own role playing system but maybe as inspiration to make some homebrew rules for DD to fix up some of these holes or even in their own systems that you're doing okay so dungeons and dragons fun fundamentally functions are like that the adventurer has control of a five foot radius around them. This technically means, uh, when you look at the rules specifically, that no one can pass this area without encountering you. And that, that actually makes sense, okay? Because I have pretty, I, I can reach anywhere around me pretty quickly. But when it comes to combat, this is where things get a little interesting. The Dungeons and Dragons combat rules state that if you're using a medium or even a large weapon that doesn't have reach, you can only attack people who are in the adjacent five foot area to you or essentially five foot distance from you. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, as someone who has studied a bit of swordplay throughout my life, uh, if I, so I will use Boromir here as an example. And uh, if I was to fight someone this close, this is profoundly dangerous, okay? In actual fact, when you're facing off against an opponent in swordplay specifically, and this is before you actually get engage in the bind or you're doing a move, because when you do that, yes, you can end up much closer, like the five foot distance here, but when you're just facing off opponents, being ready to offend one another, it's actually around 10 foot, like literally from here to here. And just to point this out, I will, you know, stand here, okay, and bring in a opposing version of myself just over in that square. Now, if we're in this square and we lean forward a bit, look how close our swords are coming to one another, okay? This is the area of danger. As soon as you get this close, suddenly, not only can you hit them, but they can hit you very quickly. And so when you're facing off against an opponent, this is actually the standard range that you usually operate in. And so just in the basic stances of your opponents, five foot adjacent is way too close in real life. No, no, uh, like I said, it's actually more, you know, distance to 10 feet. The next oddity in the Dungeons and Dragons rules is the uh, rule that you can only attack opponents five feet away from you with weapons that don't have reach. So, Let's, let's just double check this. And this is with a one-handed weapon, not even a long sword, just longer. If the Dungeon and Dragons rules were more realistic, they would actually allow you to attack opponents 10 feet away from you, even if you don't have weapons with reach. But what if you do have a weapon with reach? All right, I have a pole arm, specifically my sword staff prop that I made for my video on the sword staff, okay? Uh, it's an actual real weapon. So, first of all, just without even moving, yeah, definitely, I can hit, strike the opponent 10 feet away. But what if I go an additional one foot? And from here, just lunging, absolutely. You can actually, without moving out of, you know, well, when I say out of, okay, I consider this a lunge and not necessarily a step. I would say a step is when you actually step okay because your other the, the the back foot is not moving from position and when you lunge 
to strike your opponent. Oh, hang on, I didn't lunge far enough then, but you can do it. So lunge, look at that. So much easier, right? My foot didn't move. By keeping this back foot planted, I technically haven't moved out of that square. But what about great swords? Because I have always made the contention that great swords in the Dungeons and Dragons rules don't actually operate the way they do in real life. Real great swords are long, okay? Particularly long, and therefore should have the quality or the weapon characteristic of reach. Uh, and like, for just hitting people 10 feet away from you, Cake, easy as anything, it has not even with much of a lean. But what about the, uh, you know, weapons that really have reach, like the long sword stuff that I showed with that, that could actually hit people 15 feet away from you. Well, I think it can, but this one is debatable because for me to reach, you know, that opponent, I'm gonna have to have my back foot really on the edge of the square here and do a very large lean, but I can absolutely strike him, still keeping myself technically in this square. So, yeah, I actually think great swords should definitely have reach, especially if there are other weapons that have reach that of similar size. Like this is the length of standard spear, okay? It's not as long as the sword staff, but the great sword is very close in length to this. And yeah, I could absolutely hit my opponent with this, keeping my foot in this back square. And so I think the actual ranges is that standard weapons can hit opponents 10 feet away from you and reach weapons can hit opponents 15 feet away from you. I'm happy to acknowledge that that point can be debated a little. If you interpret the rules to mean that you can't attack anyone without most of your body being in the adjacent square, well then it's true. When I'm using a weapon without reach and standing in the square 10 feet away, I need to lunge moving most of my body into the square that is five foot away from the opponent to hit them, even though I can plant my back foot and not move it out of the square that is 10 feet away from the opponent. But because most of my body is essentially in the square that is five foot away, that could be interpreted to mean that I am technically in the square that is five foot away and not ten foot away from the opponent. So I think that is a legitimate and fair argument, but my point about being able to strike opponents ten foot away from you with weapons that don't have reach and not fully moving out of the square that is 10 foot away still stands. There should be some type of allowance for adventurers that are using weapons without reach to hit opponents 10 foot away from you without technically moving out of that square that is 10 foot away. And this then increases if the weapon has reached to 15 foot away from you, because it literally physically can be done in the real world. The next thing that I want to point out is how easy it is to move just five foot. I mean, it's not that when you're fighting, you're like, eh, da, 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 and now I'm here. You can shift five foot distance with a single step that quickly and back. And how quickly did that take? It's like barely even a second, right? And so with that in mind, I actually think moving to the adjacent square in a combat round should be a free action almost. And when you attack someone, even if you're say a square distance from them at 10 feet, when you attack, you have the option of either moving into the adjacent square or remaining in this square. Makes sense. Point of clarification, in Dungeons and Dragons 3.5, you can move five feet as a free action to attack an opponent 10 feet away from you and not necessarily use up any of your movement distance. But the point I'm making here is that you should have the freedom to remain in the square that was 10 feet away from you because you can attack people 10 feet away from you while keeping a foot in your starting position without actually having moved fully into the square closest to the combatant. In Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, this is a little bit different. When looking through the rules, it really does seem like if you want to attack someone 10 feet away from you and remain in the same square from which you started, you would need to move 5 foot closer to the opponent, attack them, and then 5 foot back to the square you started from, using up 10 feet of your 30 foot movement distance in the round. I was saying before, if you are this close to your opponent, it is a dangerous distance, which is true. But it's not to say you can't fight your opponent, be in the bind, even grapple and do things being this close. No, absolutely you can do it. And you can switch around doing you know lots of different attacks right here okay and you can defend yourself adequately enough it's just a lot more difficult because it is so easy to hit your opponent right here but no you can engage in combat at that distance it's just when you are facing off before you get really close and start to do some actions the standard distance and comfortable distance the measure in which you you know keep to your opponent is around this 10 foot and just while I think of it 
I generally prefer meters over feet. Uh, I think feet is a little antiquated. I know I'm such an elitist, right? But for a setting that's based around medieval-like themes, especially Dungeons and Dragons, something like that, uh, using feet and inches is far more appropriate because meters didn't exist back then. And technically, did feet really exist in the same way? No, they use different measurements. But oh, feet and inches is more appropriate. It just fits a little better. So that's why I'm perfectly fine in doing five foot ranges and stuff like that for this video, because in the context of D&D, role-playing games, and all that stuff. Uh, the next thing that I want to point out is that whenever I change my kind of ensemble, I do get a lot of questions as to, where'd you get that shot? Yeah, because you, sometimes people like it. And, uh, you know, the, uh, this new Gambeson is from Steel Mastery. I think it's pretty darn cool. What? That's why I got it. Option to remove sleeves, and so when it's a blazing hot day like this, I can remove the sleeves and wear something a bit more airy, because you might also notice I'm wearing a fake chainmail printed shirt and pants. And these are my own design. You can actually, I sell these. You can get them through my Teespring store. I design them and uh, print them on a full print t-shirt thing. And for when it's really hot like this, something like this is brilliant. And it isn't a perfect analog, of course. It doesn't compare to the real thing, but the real thing is so darn heavy, especially in weather like this. I'd have heat stroke by now. I'd be so exhausted. And so it serves its purpose. And I think it's really cool. So if you're, if you're interested, chainmail, print, t-shirts, pants, also hoodies, my Teespring store, link in the description. And of course, still mastery for the Gamerson, which is cool. And as well, Audible, the sponsor of this video, as I mentioned, because if you do the Audible one, you can get something for free, which is awesome. All right then, how would these realities actually come into, you know, the gameplay of the role-playing game itself? And well, what if you have a something barring your path that spans about five feet. Could be a small stream, it could be a couple of things in the way, and the fact or notion that you can't still hit your opponent, someone ten feet away from you, is contradicted by physical reality. You can actually do it. And so if the player says, what if I just lean or reach really hard, the answer saying, ah, oh, the rules don't allow it, it's very unsatisfying because that's not what you can do in reality. And I personally think game masters should always be open to having exceptions in rules for stuff like this that are just logical and to reward player creativity. The next really odd thing about Dungeons & Dragons combat is the idea of the round order. Now technically a round is supposed to last six seconds and within that six seconds you can move 30 feet uh, do an attack or an action, uh, it can vary, and depending on what level you can actually get away with more attacks in the round. First of all, let's challenge the idea of moving 30 feet in 6 seconds. So 30 feet would be 5, 10, 15, so I would get to this square, and then 20, 25, and 30. And that would be my range of motion in 6 seconds. So, let's test it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, oh, so at a casual pace, yes. So I think that is actually mostly realistic. And if you're sprinting, you can move double the distance, which works quite well. But what doesn't work well is that the round operates in a successive order between whoever is engaged in the round. And so if I'm in this square and I move to attack and then move back to this square, which is my full range of movement and a single attack, well then, technically, I'm not standing here for another six seconds for my opponent to do whatever they're going to do, and then for the next person in the round to do what they're doing, and so on and so forth, and I'm just kind of standing here. Now, I understand this is a gameplay mechanic, and we see it in video games all the time, but for role-playing game, you can do it in such a way in which it's not unrealistic. It'll take too long to explain it in detail, but just briefly, the way that we've tackled it in, say, cogent roleplay, is that everyone's actions happened at mostly the same time in the round. And we do that by having a mechanic called the combat role. And in your role, you say what you're gonna do, which is going to technically happen at the same time other people do it. And if you are lower on the initiative order, opponents can say what they're gonna do in response to what you're gonna do at the same time to try and stuff up your actions because they have high reflex they can react to what you're trying to do and that's one of the benefits of reflex and so if I wanted to jump on a table and my opponent has a higher reflex he can say I'm gonna to run to the table and flip it over and so all the players are technically declaring what they're doing in the say at the same time and then they do what is called a combat role which stands as their role for the entire round and against every other opponent's combat role and so even if I'm getting attacked by multiple opponents I don't need to make successive roles to adjust for them all the combat role technically stands for your quality of actions throughout that entire space of time against everyone. And it works really well. We've play tested it heaps on tabletop time and it's brilliant and it's more realistic and satisfying as a result. So instead of movement, I hit you 
it's your turn. You can try and hit me. Oh, you missed my turn. Oh, double hit. Ah, ha ha, now you're a bit more damaged. Your turn. It plays out far more realistically. But this isn't to say you should go check out Cogent Roleplay. I, I, I suggest you do. I think you'll get a kick out of it. But it's also a way to demonstrate that it can be done more realistically in D&D and in any role-playing system you might be developing. Fighting multiple opponents is a very interesting thing when you try and visualize how it must play out according to Dungeons & Dragons rules. And it again comes off as very unrealistic and unsatisfying because if you have your primary opponent and say, you know, you're in the adjacent square and you attack them and then the other opponents are attacking you, either you're standing there doing nothing and let it bouncing off your armor, or if you do a more kind of interpretive way of looking at the armor class. And so if they hit under 10, that would be a miss because the base armor class is 10. If you have a dexterity bonus, if they hit within the range of the, your dexterity bonus, you dodge. And if they hit within the range of your armor, as it goes up, it would bounce off the armor. And so there are interpretive ways. You could be doing this, you could be doing that, trying to dodge. But with how long the rounds could technically play out, because every single person's move should, by the rules, stand for six seconds, it just comes off feeling very janky and awkward. And it's always kind of annoyed me that you couldn't just do one wide sweep and try and hit multiple opponents around you. And look, you can do it with certain feats in Dungeons and Dragons, but even a noob should be able to just do a wide slash to offend a wider area. And so again, this is one of those things that logically you should be able to do, even if you're a level one noob, but the rules say you can't which is annoying. A point of reference that I'll now demonstrate from Cogent Roleplay, and again, this is just an example to perhaps give you inspiration, but also to show you that the system that my brother and I made actually works really well, is that your single combat roll for the round, if it is higher than a certain number of opponents that are attacking you, you can technically damage them if your combat roll was high enough, regardless of your level. And this very much depends on your opponent's combat roll because they're all kind of rolled to kind of play out at the same time, there are ex exemptions when things have to play kind of one after the other, but everything essentially tries to play out at the same time, which makes the round dynamic and also the descriptive way of just the role play really engaging and fun. And so if you get a really high combat roll and this opponent and your two other opponents got really low combat rolls to the points where you get what's called a, an advantage or victory level. And depending on the victory level, you can choose to trip, to damage, to do any number of things. And so you could say, if you've got enough of an advantage against all your opponents to trip them all up, you could say, all right, because you've got a high enough roll, then you can say, the, add the descriptive kind of element to it, which gives you really engaged in the role play. You can say, you just leant down and you did this wide sweep, knocking at all your opponent's feet and afraid of the blade, they either jumped, knocked, tangled over, or you hit with the flat and you knock them all over in that single round with one action. And so this single combat roll can actually be applied to multiple actions in the round and it plays out awesomely. Oh, and just the important caveat that I was demonstrating from Cogent Roleplay is that uh, if your combat role was only better than, say, this opponent and your two other guys beat your own combat role, then you can adjust the descriptive way in which you describe how the round played out, or the game master gets to do it. But you can say, you got a really good strike against this opponent, but because your roll wasn't high enough to, say, damage these guys, they're attacking you, but say they didn't get high enough to do a victory level against you. So again, you describe in the narrative saying you're able to dodge, move around, or duck the opponents, or after you attack, you're able to sweep down and block. And so it becomes a far more narrative-driven type of role-playing, and it's, it's a lot of fun. I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, because Jazza and I were intending on announcing this a little bit later, but because it integrates so well with the subject of this video, it's too much of an opportunity to let pass by. And it's that Jazza and I have been working on something really huge. We will be rolling out the beta of Cogent Roleplay in the most cool, awesome way than I think anyone is expecting. When Jazza and I revisited Cogent, we both realized how great a rule system it really is. It is so simple and streamlined, yet satisfies even the most demanding of role players to give you all the options and tools you need to do anything you want. And that flexibility is held within a simple, versatile, and structured rule system that is really satisfying. 
So much so that we kind of feel this could be the role-playing game of the next generation. And there are a number of things that we've always focused on, making it as accessible as possible. And one of the big things that we've done from the very get-go, even with the alpha release, is that we've always made the core rulebook completely free. And now we have devoted hundreds of hours and spent thousands of dollars on making it even more accessible than ever before. And we are actually developing an app an actual app where which will have the entire cogent rulebook completely for free and so you can go to the rules and everything is here you can go to um you know the challenge levels get all the information that you need and this is just the scratch of the surface we plan to integrate dynamic character sheets cross-referencing so you can just if if you need a, to look up a rule one you know touch and bang it'll take you to where the what rule you need you'll be able to make all the roles that you need to in the game through the app as well so you could play the whole game with this app and we're going to be making it available completely for free. There's a little bit more polishing that needs to be done on it, okay? And we want your help in rolling out the beta of Cogent Roleplay. And so if you're interested in giving it a go, the uh, alpha rulebook is still available at CogentRoleplay.com. You can go download it for free, get involved in the community. We're launching a Cogent Roleplay Discord server where you can give us feedback and updates and how you're going. And we can also test things with you for the rollout of the beta that's also going to be coming out on the app as well and so this is hugely exciting sign up for updates at cogentroleplay.com as well and make cogent roleplay possibly could we one of the best most accessible versatile dynamic tabletop role-playing game systems in the world and so there we go and as you've probably been out of tell uh, let me just get that in there uh, I have one or two pet peeves with the Dungeons and Dragons combat system but look this is not to say that the system doesn't work it does okay and I'm not saying that every rule should be thrown out uh, and uh, even though I was giving a comparison to other role-playing systems that I feel address the, uh, the things of, that you can do you know in the kind of what could a person actually do in these situations I feel it does address it better I think there are some little small tweaks that you can give to the D&D rule system to make it work a little bit better like the range in which you can actually hit opponents. How it addresses multiple opponents and turn order is always a tricky one. But as I said, I'm not saying you should throw out all the rules, okay? And it's a game, you'll have fun with it regardless. But, you know, I think giving more options to the players, to being able, giving them the option to be able to explore all the possibilities that should logically be available to their characters is a really good move. And so this is just kind of, like I said, a bit of a demonstration to show some of their weaknesses and, and a bit of holes here and there of how realistic the Dungeons and Dragons combat system really is. So I thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you on the next video on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell.